people serving in the U.S. military and the contributions they have made. We're also going to address issues that predominantly affect black veterans and the stigma faced by LGBT veterans. Um, the composition of the military, as uh, veterans in the audience know, it's uh, from people of all backgrounds. Um, some people come from small towns where they have not been exposed to anyone other than cisgender white people. Um, uh, and sometimes people sign up with the military uh, because there's not a lot of opportunity. Um, I myself, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Navy. I moved here from Canada um, uh, from a divorced family. Uh, my parents were divorced. I didn't have a lot of uh, opportunity for education, so the military was a really good uh, opportunity for me to do something after high school. Um, and um, so we're going to address that. And uh, when we get to the stigma faced by LGBT veterans, one of the things that really stood out for me for the Black Veterans of Social Justice was their website, which states all persons could be productive, positive contrib contributions to society no matter what sex, race, social class, military labels, or problems may beset them. All humans wish to do the right thing, but do not often get the opportunity. Given a boost, a helping hand, all people, particularly veterans, would respond positively and productive, productively. So um, I think that that is a great premise to uh, start the evening. Um, and before we start with the, the rest of it, I just want to give a little introduction to this wonderful panel that we have here tonight. To my right, we've got Wendy Sharice McClinton, who joined the United States Army right after high school and served for 10 years. She's a decorated veteran who served during Desert Storm Persian Gulf during that era, and she's a graduate of the United States Army Logistical Management College and Stanford University Graduate School of Business. Currently, Ms. McClinton serves on the board of directors of the National Coalitions for Homeless Veterans and the New York City Mayor's Veterans Advisory Board. And Wendy has received numerous citations and awards that mark her tenure with the military, Black Veterans of Social Justice Incorporated, the National Association for Black Veterans, and the National Association of Black Military Women. And Ty Martin, to her right, is a decorated veteran who served in the United States Navy from 1965 to 71, and the United States Army from 84 to 92, as a sergeant for the transportation unit in the 369th Regiment Armory, Historic National Guard Armory located on Fifth Avenue right here in Harlem. He received the National Defense Service Medal, two Vietnam Service Medals, the Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal, and the Meritorious Unit Commendation Ribbon. Since his military service, Ty has worked at the Sage Harlem Center, and uh, he is a member of the Schoenberg Corporation Board and Trustee Com Community Board 10 Senior Task Force Community. He's also a board member of the Harlem Advocates for Seniors Incorporated. In addition, Ty has been featured in two documentary films, You Are Not Alone, a 2012 documentary by Stanley Bennett play that explores many of the underlying social factors that contribute to the high rates of depression among gay black men. And Before You Knew It, which was a 2013 documentary directed by P.J. Ravel, that follows the lives of three gay seniors who have surmounted prejudice and defied expectation to form communities of strength, renewal, and camaraderie. Um, Herbert S. Jackson Sweat, to Ty's immediate right, Jr., excuse me, um, enlisted in the U.S. Army in April 1966. He was deployed to Vietnam in August 1967 at the height of the conflict, where he was assigned to Company A, 4th Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment, and the 173rd Airborne Brigade as a rifleman. Herbert is a highly decorated veteran who participated in four separate campaigns in Vietnam. He has earned four Bronze Stars, the National Defense Service Medal, the Presidential Unit Citation, two overseas bars, the parachutist badge, the expert badge with automatic rifle bar, the combat infantryman badge of the Republic of Viet Vietnam's gallantry cross with palm unit citation. Since his military service in the Army, Herbert was awarded a City of New York proclamation for a service to the country during the Vietnam War. He was profiled at the Brooklyn Historical Society's exhibit, In Your Own Voice, from 2007 to 2011, and he is a founding member of Veterans of the Vietnam War Incorporated's Henry J. Green Post No. 1 and currently serves as commander. He also serves as a Brooklyn chapter commander for the National Association of Black Veterans Incorporated and the facilitator of the Veterans Action Group and is a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I'm Ashton Stewart. I'm the manager of Sage Vets, which is a New York State program for elder LGBT veterans, a veteran of the United States Navy, First Gulf War, and member of the American Legion and VFW. 
And without further ado, Wendy McClinton is going to take over next and share a wonderful PowerPoint and some of the great history that we're going to learn about tonight. So, Wendy, please. Thank you, thank you. Is it all right? Uh, if y'all don't mind, family, if y'all if I stand up, because, uh, all right, great. <laughs> Huh? No, I don't need a mic. No, you need a, a oh, that's TV good. I can't get Thank you so much. Does it come out? Thank you so much. And I'm just going to stand over here and go back to my place. You know how veterans, we just follow and stand in line right in my place. And um, this is such an honor and a privilege to be here and to share you know, with you all tonight. And um, to give you a little bit of history about Black Veterans for Social Justice, a little bit about how I came to that agency and where I've come from in the agency. And it's a 41-year not-for-profit that was started back in 1979 where a group of Black veterans who came in from the Vietnam era and came to sit down to a table and came home from after serving in such a conflict and was not able to receive the services that veterans need. They sat around a table and they decided that they would um, devise a place where everyone would be able to be welcome, as Ashton read, where everyone decides that they want to do good, but they're not always given the opportunity. But with a boost and a helping hand, we will try to make that happen. And that's just what they did as they began with Black Veterans for Social Justice. They started um, with a storefront on Fulton Street. And then all of a sudden they moved to a little bit more to 686 Fulton Street. And that's where I met Black Veterans for Social Justice, transferring from the 25th Infantry Division Light Mechanized Schofield Barracks in Hawaii with three children under the age of five. And when I got back to New York, I was homeless. And as I went to look for some place to stay, there wasn't any place for me. And I wound up, to make a long story short, on the Grand Concourse at the PATH there with my three children in uniform. And I asked, was there any place for me to go? And they said, what makes you so different? What makes you any different from any woman that's in here with children? I said, well, I'm trained to kill you. I'm a little bit different. See, they really don't understand the difference. They just look at you and look at us and think that, guess what? You're just like me. No, I'm not just like you. I have a little bit more with me than that, that you can see. And um, they wound up, after I said that, my children and I wound up at Kings County. That's where they shipped us to stay. And there was someone that came with a flyer, and the flyer said, are you homeless? Do you need a job? Do you need housing? This is the place for you. And I wound up at Black Veterans for Social Justice. I got to the door, the phone was ringing, and nobody answered it. And I just walked in, and I sat there, and I looked, and I said, why anybody answering the telephone? And I picked up the phone and I said, Black Vets, and I've been there ever since. And that was 26 years ago. And it was that agency that gave me my first job as a secretary. They gave me my first house. I was the first female veteran to live in their housing unit at 210 Hart Street, the second housing development for veterans of low income or no income. And I was able to stay there until I was able to get on my feet. And then I moved through the organization. And in 2010, when the CEO or the founder of Black Veterans for Social Justice, Joe Mashariki, retired, the board of directors then appointed me the CEO of Black Veterans for Social Justice. And I say that because that is the way, the way that anyone can come in and evolve through an organization and grow. That's the same tender loving care and listening ear that they give to all veterans who come through the door. No matter what may beset them, no matter what may be side, the goal is to find out where you are and take you to where you wanna go and be that assistance to help you get there. Today we do that. I thank the staff and uh, the veteran staff of BVSJ that came out with us from our HVRP programs, the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Programs. We have our 
jobs to build on programs. We have our Veterans Service Center. We have housing, 400 units of housing that is utilized for veterans, their families, and the community, those of low income. We don't just service veterans, we service all veterans. Whether you have honorably discharged, dishonorably discharged, it doesn't matter. We're here to meet the needs of the veterans within the community. So. The organization was established to do and would use the history of, of the past veterans and the services that they provided. We capulate on that. We believe in the principles of Kwanzaa. We believe in that. We strive for that because we understand that everything in the organization is diverse. But we had to find one thing that would ground us, one thing that would build a substratum or the foundation that we could continue to continue to build this legacy on. And so April 17th, we'll be 41 years old and um, working and being and living in the community. So what we wanted to do as an icebreaker, just to bring up the history, and then I'm going to turn it over to a past board chair of Black Veterans for Social Justice, a pillar within our, our organization, Mr. Herbert Sweat. But in that, everyone got a piece of paper, for each, one who, who, each one who took one, because what you're going to do, everyone didn't get one. We only had a few. So we handed them out. And what we would like for you to do, as the PowerPoint comes on, and I'm going to walk with the microphone, if you feel comfortable. All right, and as it come on, and when you see the picture, when you see on the, the slideshow the name that you have, we're going to ask that you stand up and read aloud who that person is and, 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 and what, he ha who, what he or she has done to make our black history so important. Celebrating Black History Month, acknowledging African American veterans. African American veterans have served the United States with honor. As February marks Black History Month, here's a look at no notable African American military heroes in history. Who has that? Who has General Colin Powell? Somebody got it. Who got it? Read it? No? Okay. You want me to read it? I can read it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we family, y'all. This is a good thing, right? General Colin Luther Powell, former United States National Security Advisor. Colin Luther Powell is a United States statesman and a retired four-star general in the United States Army. He was the 65th United States Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005, serving under President George W. Bush. He was the first African American appointed to that position. He was the first and so far the only African American to serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Who's got the Union Forces? Somebody's got the Union Forces. Molly, where's the Union Forces? Huh? Okay, you want to stand up and read it? Can you see it? Somebody got the paper, but it's all right. I don't need the mic. Okay, go ahead. The Union Forces during the Civil War from. Microphone, please. Thank you. For the Zoom. The Union Forces. During the Civil War, around one seven was that one hundred and hundred and seventy nine thousand black people served in the United in the Union Army, while nineteen thousand served in the Navy. They were commissioned officers, chaplains, cooks, guards, sergeants, spies, scouts, and nurses. Who has Major Delaney? Who has Major Delaney? What did y'all do with the paper? No, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I gave it out to the gentleman. He gave them all out. He told me to give them out to everybody. All right, here we go. Who would like to read Major Delaney, please? Thank you. Give me the rest of them. So I make sure I get them. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Just in case. My <laughs> Microphone. Oh, <laughs> 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 
Maj Major Martin Robinson Delaney. As the first African-American field officer in the Union Army, he led the 52nd Colored Troops Regiment, called the father of the black nationalism. Delaney attended Harvard for three weeks, but was kicked out after a petition from the white students. Okay. <laughs> Since women could not enlist, the abolitionists served as a volunteer with the Massachusetts State Troops stationed at Fort Monroe in Virginia. She worked as a nurse, cook, laundress, and assisted fugitives during the Civil War. She was also part of a group of scouts during the Ombahai River Raid where they liberated 750 slaves. After the end of the war, she spent 30 years successfully fighting for compensation for her services. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's, That's okay. We'll help you. Susan King Taylor. Susie King Taylor. As a young slave, Taylor secretly learned how to read and write. When the Union Army began forming regiments of African-American soldiers, she was hired first as a laundress and then as a nurse during the Civil War. Buffalo soldiers. Buffalo soldier units distinguished themselves in the battlefields of the Spanish-American War, World War I, and the Italian campaign of World War II. Harlem Hellfighters? Yes. All right now, we cooking with gas now. <laughs> okay, the Harlem Hellfighters, calling themselves the Harlem Rattlers, the African-American Combat Unit, the 369th Infantry Regiment is said to have never lost a man to capture or any ground that they had taken during World War I. They earned the Croix de Guerre from the French Army for gallantry in action. Thank you so much. Montford Point Marines. No, you need the microphone. You have the microphone. Oh. Because you got to be on the Zoom. <laughs> Montfort Point Marines, the first black Marines. They got their name from the military facility at Montfort Point, North Carolina, where they underwent training. Despite facing segregation, they served valiantly at Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and in the Vietnam War. Excellent. First Lieutenant, G there you go. Hey. Uh, first Lieutenant Vernon J. Baker, then a second lieutenant in the infantry during World War II. Baker demonstrated heroism during a battle at uh, Via Rio, Italy in 1945. A Medal of Honor was finally bestowed upon him by President Bill Clinton in 1997. Tuskegee Airmen. Hey. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen. The first African African American military pilots were trained at a segregated air base in Tuskegee, Alabama, and served as an Army flying squadron during World War II. They became known in Italy for their record of flying 200 of its 205 bomber escort missions without a single loss. Their tenacious tenaciousness earned them two presidential citations. General Davis, Jr. General O. Davis, Jr. Come on, where are you? I know you're here. Come on, baby. Come on. There you go. There you go. Hold the mic. Go ahead. Hey, come on. Hey. Hey, come on. A commander of the famed, the famed Tuggish, this cussy, um, airman during World War II. Davis was the first black Air Force general, a West 
point graduate. His military honors include an Air Force Discussionist Distinguished Service Medal Army, Distinguished Service Medal Silver Star, and the Elysian of Merit. Excellent. Let's give him a hand. That, I think, concludes the slideshow and that um, with the history of some of our, of our black um, veterans and look at where we have come from because of them. We also want to take a minute just to remember that we lost another great um, this week, um, Gen Major General Nathaniel James. Um, he was the uh, president and um, governing body of the 369th Historical Society. Uh -huh. And on the 21st of this month, they were scheduled to have, and every year they have a Women's History Month gala, uh, luncheon and gala, and they're still gonna continue to do that, and they're gonna be honoring him. His funeral services are going to be on next week, and I'll probably get that information and you can share, because he was one of the pillars in helping to develop a lot of the veteran services that we receive here. So we just want to remember him and remember his family um, in prayer. Also, we would like to also invite you to the memorial. And um, also, all of you are pleased and welcome to invite to march with us in the Bedford-Stuyvesant Memorial Day Parade. And that's going to be on Memorial Day. It's a mini stand down hosted by Black Veterans for Social Justice. And it's a great day from the parade to the honoring and the food and just having a great time coming out and celebrating the greatness of being veterans. Thank you for your service. And thank you for all that you do for making America great. I would like to now introduce you to Mr. Herbert Sweat, who's going to continue our history with two more important veterans that we need to know about. Good evening. I want to begin by um, reading a poem to you about people that have served. It is the soldier. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier not the campus organizer who has given us freedom to demonstrate. It is the soldier who salutes the flag, who serves beneath the flag, and whose coffin is draped by the flag, who allows the protesters to burn. This is a definition of how the individual soldier serves you, this country, and all allies abreast. Being a soldier, as some of you might know, is not an easy task. Very difficult, especially for the soldiers of color which from the very beginning of the Revolutionary War right up to today's wars or conflicts. The soldier of color has always been a person of twosomeness. For one, he had to or she had to prepare herself to die, as you heard Ms. McClinton say. This is part of our obligation, to die. So we're taught how to die. We're taught also how to free ourselves, 
which was one of the greatest things that I've learned as a young man, 18 years old, when I went into the war. How to free yourself. People of color fighting any war, civil war, World War I, World War II, Korea, any of them, they fought two wars. One, physical, for the United States of America, and another mentally, for their individualism as a human being seeking freedom and dignity here in the United States, which we have lived in. It's very important to remember these soldiers of color, as you heard a few of them mention, it's behooving to us, the service people of color that serves this country with their life. But when we came home from the Vietnam War, and I came home in 1968, it wasn't a pleasant time here in the States. And we must remember what were going on in the 60s. A lot of racial tension, a lot of laws being advocated this way and that way. You never, as a person of color, truly understood where we actually stood. So we try to exemplify ourselves as a person of integrity. That's a soldier of color. We always must prove ourselves. I don't care whether it's in a sports arena, whether it's in the Department of Defense's arena, whether it's in the academic arena, whether it's just in our neighborhood arena. We always must prove ourselves. Well, the youngest reciprocant of the Medal of Honor was just 11 years old. Interesting. How did an 11-year-old receive the Medal of Honor? Do anyone have that answer? Well, this is a history month, so we're giving up history. 11 year old. His father was in the Civil War. Now think of that. Everybody here should have seen the great Denzel Washington in glory. One of the main Civil War actions that were fought during the Civil War. And this unit, the 54th Regiment, had a soldier up in there. And his son wasn't left at home. He took his son to the war with him. His son was actually 10 when they got there, and he was 11 when he received the award. He was the drummer boy, the drummer boy. Just like when you watch that picture, you didn't realize that the actor who wore the glasses that always had the argument with Denzel Washington, who everyone probably remembers, he was always beefing with this young guy that wore the glasses. Well, that young guy was Frederick Douglass' son. He was the member of the 54th. That's why he was educated. That's why he knew the commander as a friend and not a commander. 
And the next one that died carrying that flag of the United States was Frederick Douglass's other son. So our father, Frederick Douglass, had two sons in that 54th Regiment, United States, what? Colored troops. When some of you old timers go to the young people don't know this too much, but when you go to the graveyards and you bury your dead, we all are kind of observant and we look around and we see the gravestones and the, they look this way and some look beautiful and some look that way and we we'll want. But every now and then you might bump into one that has USCT on it. And that was when and who was known as the first freed people of color that served in this civil war. And they were given the names, the United States Colored Troops. They fought from the emancipational time that Abraham Lincoln signed this into effect, January the 1st, 1863, until 1865 when the war ended. And they wasn't discharged people. Like, how many here are soldiers? Raise your hand. Very interesting. The average one of you were discharged. I don't care whether it was good or bad. <laughs> you were discharged. Well, your United States Colored Troops in 1865 was not discharged. They were just released. This went into the next stage of the, of the so-called United States Colored Troops, 9th and 10th Cavalry. You've heard of that. Pretty sure a lot of you have heard of the 9th and 10th Cavalry. They were basically called the first unit of the Buffalo Soldiers. And actually, that wasn't their true name. Their true name was given by the Cheyenne Indians, and they were called the Wild Buffalo. And I guess you can understand that because a lot of people today think that people of color are a little wild. They think we do a lot of wild things. Well, again, we're trying to belong. We're trying to fit in. And each interim that we have an opportunity to apply ourselves, sometimes it looks a little wild. Because we know we have to be second to none. This is why we have such great athletes and great academicisms in our students, but it's not shown. So here we're trying to offer you some of our achievements that were military. And the first one to receive the Medal of Honor was Sergeant William Carney. He was the first African American to receive this Medal of Honor. <coughs> and out of this great Medal of Honor, up to this day, there has been 3,498 medals given. If I'm not mistaken, it could be a few more now since some. Um, President Obama. I think there was about four to five more given. But out of that, how many medals do you think that the people of color that served all of these wars, how many do you think they got? 
How many, you know, the youngest Marine to die in Vietnam, which was my war, was 14 years old. He was a very big guy. He was a Marine. And how did he get in the service at 14? Because he said he was older. Okay? They have his statue down there in Paris Islands. But out of those Medal of Honors winners, you only have 88. 88. And this is why you still hear, you still hear presidents giving this award to some of these veterans or soldiers that have served. And now, years later, 40, 50 years, they dig us up and offer us the medal. This is how our history has run from since we've gotten here. We've always been looked at as not even human. But yet, we have proved gallantry. We have proven ourselves to be so dedicated to this country that we would give our lives. I'm one sitting right here looking at you. I joined the service because my family members joined the service. My father is Shinnecock Indian. That comes from the nation of the Algonquin Indians. And do you know when uh, World War II, you heard of naturally the cold talkers? You heard of them, right? Cold talkers. Mm-hmm. These was Indians, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, do you know that more Native Americans have served in the Department of Defense than any other nationality in America? That's puzzling, <laughs> you know, considering what transpired during the advance of the West from 1866 on to today. So this little part of history that I'm trying to give to you, you already know it. It's just this is it face to face. Know, behold, that the truth always surfaces itself, as they say. The cream always rises to the top. Old saying. So we go on to understand that Something good has happened recently. We had two Brigadier Generals named. Do anyone know those Brigadier Generals? Well, I'm going to give you a hint. They were a person of color, both of them. And one was a, a woman, and one was a man. And who are they? This is how low kept is kept. <laughs> but her name, she got three stars. Niger West, United States Army. She just received her third star about two, three months ago. The other one was um, this new general that our president just commanded him to be the leader of the new part of the Department of Defense, which we know today as what? Space Force. Now imagine that. Not Star Trek. <laughs> Space Force. You know, like the police. Force, like the era force. Well, he decided he wanted a space force. And he named this general of, 
I love to be the Brigadier General to run it. So there's things that are happening again that are very low cap. And you have to keep up with your history. You have to talk to each other about it. You cannot be afraid to read about some of the greatest people that ever served this country. You've got to dig for your truth. Mm -hmm. To be all you can be is all you can do. And you know deep down within yourself that no matter what lanes of life, what choices of life, what indignities of life has been persuaded against you? You know that you are a mighty people. Thank you. If I could, if I could get the mic, I'd rather stand up so that and of course, thank you, Jesse. Um, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. No, that's okay. Well, after hearing the soldier talk about the military, it's like, wow, that reminded me so much of what it was like in the Navy. I got nervous listening to him <laughs> because, because it reminded me of what it was like going into the Navy at the age of 17, fresh out of Harlem, and into the Navy. I wasn't conscious of um, racism, homophobia, the only thing that I knew was I was from New York and I was a Yankee. And there were people in Texas, black people, who were angry that the South had lost. So I had a lot, a lot of learning to do. But one of the things that I learned was how to be a man. I kind of thought that how to be a man was I wouldn't be homosexual. What I'd learned in the long run was how do you show up for life? And that's precisely what I did. When we, I, I was in Vietnam a few times, and I can remember as a young man thinking, oh, The, fire, uh, uh, the explosions look like fireworks, you know? That whole trauma of searching for bodies, because that was one of the things we did in the Navy, going up and down uh, the coast looking for bodies that may have been injured. I didn't get it. I didn't understand the traumas that were happening. I didn't realize the fear that if anybody found out that I was, I guess, gay, homosexual, or like men, whatever, I could be thrown out of the Navy. And I had this, this image in my mind thinking, if I'm thrown out of the Navy, my photo will be on the Amsterdam News and I'll never work again. And the, it real, but I didn't know any better, and I was petrified that someone would find out. Of course, there were sailors who knew the comet was, but I and some group and a, a group of us, we were in denial. We didn't understand why whenever we would uh, dock at some port, that the local men would always follow us and they were always up in the mix. We were just, I was just having fun and very much in denial. 
I didn't realize when I got out of the Navy that um, more than just promising myself that I would never, ever work for the government, ever, I didn't realize that I had been traumatized. It never occurred to me. I just knew that I didn't want to go back. And as a veteran now, I did not feel comfortable connecting to the VA. Like I said earlier, just listening to this man reminded me of the trauma of being a part of that. Now, I'm not going to say that it was a, a bad experience because there were lots of things that happened. I can remember after listening to country and western music 24-7 that I was actually humming those tunes. <laughs> <No way. laughs> Where did I come from? You know, I learned how to accept racism as it was, and I was able to continue to do the best that I could. I went straight up in rank. That was a great thing. I did what I was told, and when I got out, I was out. <laughs> now, 10 years later or so, I began to be to wonder what would it be like to be in the armed forces. So I joined the um, the United States Army Reserves, which was different from the Navy because this was the 369th Battalion, and there were all of these brothers up in there, and it was one big party. If you were over 30, you were an alcoholic. If you're under 30, you are drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the transportation unit. And and I, I will say um, a, a bull, what is it? I had, I had, my job was to drive this crane, you know. And unfortunately, they always wanted me to work in the office. You go figure. I didn't, I didn't experience racism because we were predominantly black at the 369th Battalion, but I did experience the homophobic, unspoken words, you know? Yet and still, yet and still, I had this, this need to show you that I was as good as you were. And in order to not be harassed, I had to be anybody but myself, okay? But yet and still, I loved the idea of being a part of something. And when it was time to move on, that's precisely what I did. Uh, I've had many conversations about Vietnam, about veterans, and I can remember there's a point in my life where, as maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was wondering, why do we, we as veterans, why we never talk about Vietnam? Because there were lots of horror stories going on. As a vet, as a sailor in Vietnam, I saw what had came to be that ugly American. I've seen, I saw some things that were just unbelievable. And yet and still, I didn't talk about it. I didn't think about it. I pretended that it didn't happen. So today, when I go out into the community and I talk to our, our seniors, and many of them are vets, it's the same scenarios with them. They would rather forget what happened. There's a lot of mistrust about the, um, the, the VA. I'm not saying that it's fact. I'm just simply saying 
this is how many of our people react to the idea of going back and getting something that could improve the quality of their lives. As a veteran, you would think that I would be more concerned about what would happen if I need the VA. You know, I, I don't even know how to get a flag if I died. You know, I, that's kind of sort of important, but it isn't to me. Um, I do know that I feel more comfortable today by taking another look at the VA, the Veterans Associations. And that's not where I was maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago. Recently, I was on a cruise, and there was a group of veterans from the Bronx, from the uh, the VA hospital, and many of them were talking about how for years they did not make the connection to the VA because of stigma, because of fear, and a lot of them ex was talking about the traumas that they had experienced. And the more I talked with them, the more I began to realize my story is not that much different from theirs, you know? So being um, a black man who happens to be homosexual, living in America, you kind of learn how to deal with life one day at a time and in spite of all of those uh, things that I experienced, it still enabled me to continue to put one foot forward, one foot at a, one step at a time. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ty. Um, before we queue up the v video for. Um, We've got a video of one of our SAGE participants, a longtime member, George Stewart, um, who was going to be here tonight, um, but unfortunately he had a stroke in January. Um, he's doing okay. He's in a rehabilitation center now in Riverside. Um, I've visited him a couple of times, but I've, I've got a pretty deep relationship with him um, since meeting him a couple of years ago. Um, um, but before we get to his video, which uh, Jesse's going to queue up, um, I just wanted to add something about the Harlem Hellfighters. They were a remarkable platoon um, from World War I, as we discussed earlier. Undefeated. Um, they did so much to uh, fight the war and, and to save lives. And when they came home, they weren't invited to march in the parade, um, which is crushing. Um, Something else that's shocking is the white supremacy that exists in the military. Um, something I certainly wasn't prepared to see, um, but you hear stories about it, it does exist. Um, and George, his story is special because he served in 1950 and right after boot camp, he served in one of the very first integrated platoons I'm in Germany. Um, and he talks a little bit about that in this little clip. So, um, is it, is it ready to go, Jess? Yeah. There's me. Wrong Stuart. It's the other Stuart. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just thought that this would be a good segue um, before we, we address the issue of the, L, um, the, the stigma within the black community against LGBT people. I'm really looking forward to hearing about that from our panelists. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, I'll just keep talking while we're getting this going. Uh, Sage Vets, like I said, New York State program. We've got our brochures over here. Um, one of the things that we did this year, are you ready to go? Okay, I'll pick that up later. All right, thanks, Jesse. Being in a segregated outfit, we were we wanted, we were trained to be better than the average soldier. Like if they shine the top of their shoes, we shine the bottom. Well, 
you know. Shall I give you a second? Okay. I can I can keep talking. So one of the other things that uh, Sage Vats has been involved with lately is um, trying to address the issue that Ty was addressing uh, about LGBT people serving. Um, I can't tell you how many stories and conversations I've had with veterans who have told me stories about how many times they've proven themselves while serving, and yet they still experienced incredible discrimination and stigma and, and insecurity and anxiety, the things that still are with them today. A guy from North Carolina called me one day saying he's never pursued a veteran benefit because of that distrust of the VA, society, uh, mainstream institutions, you name it. But he got to a point in his life where he was so desperate, he had nowhere else to go. So, you know, we're helping him out, um, and he's doing a lot better. Um, but New York State recently uh, signed, uh, the governor signed a legislation bill called the Restoration of Honor Act. That is going to uh, grant New York State veteran benefits to anybody who was discharged for the sexual orientation. It's a huge thing. Um, he just signed it in November. We're hoping that they figure out the policy and, and how they're the procedural uh, logistics that they're working out right now. But I'm getting calls already from people who are like, hey, you know, I, I was discharged uh, I, sexual orientation or had a negative narrative on my DD-214. How do I fix this? So it's wonderful because we're starting to hear from more LGBT veterans, especially the elder veterans, because that distrust is so strong. Trying to reach out to them has been really difficult. Um, so I'll, c I'll continue with more about that later, but I just wanted to also let you know our res information is over here on this table if you are interested to learn more about Sage Vets. Um, again, like business cards, anything you need, just let me know. And here, here goes the video of George Stewart.
So I apologize for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. This is the first time that we've used Zoom. Um, so uh, we are working out a couple of kinks here. But I will share that video in our next newsletter um, so that way we can get a better look and a closer look at that next time. But what George was talking about a little bit was some of the, the care management program that we have in addition to Sage Vets. Um, this is a big part of Sage. Um, if anybody is a caregiver for somebody that's a LGBT adult or you're an LGBT adult yourself caring for somebody who doesn't identify as LGBT, we can still work with you as well. Um, we provi provide respite. We provide a lot of different support mechanisms, including a friendly visitor program. Um, and aside from that, we also have a, uh, a, a new ho housing program, both in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Um, so we got again, we've got our resources over here um, and our newsletter, of course, which Sage Vetch put, puts out every quarter. Um, but I. I don't want to go too on too far into this sage stuff because I do want to address this uh, stigma issue. Um, Wendy, um, I just want you to to talk a little bit about the stigma that exists within the Black community about LGBT people and how how it should be dealt with. The way that we deal with any type of stigma within any community, we deal with it with education, we deal with it communication. We deal with it by bringing people together, networking, speaking, having different types of, um, they used to call them back in the day, town halls. And that's where we have you know, people coming together to educate, to sit down and talk about these things. Because we can't change what we don't know. But through communication, we're able to change someone's thinking. Though we may not be able to change your belief, but we can change how you see. If we change the optic, you know how sometimes the way you can have something at a table and no matter what it is, people see it differently. I can see the cup half full, you may see it's half empty. But then when we come together to talk about these different things and make people educated on the things and what they don't know and how to make them more knowledgeable, and then it eliminates the fear, it eliminates the tension, it eliminates the pain, then they understand. A lot of times they come home and they say, well, thank you for your service. Do you know what that means? That's just words. But then when the community comes together and they talk about what do you really mean when you say thank you for your service? How are you going to thank me for my service? So the same way. The same way we came together to get the issues of Vietnam, the same way we came to get the issues of the Desert Storm, Persian Gulf era vet, Iraq, Afghanistan, through communication, are the same way we're going to address the stigmas and the concerns of the LGBTQ community. Thank you very much for that. Um, we do want to take some questions from the audience. So if anybody would like to ask a question from our panelists, um, just raise your hand. I'll come meet you with a mic. Anybody got any questions tonight while you're thinking about that? Um, I do want to talk about the VA a little bit because they have made some tremendous uh, progress in addressing some of these uh, distrust issues. Um, every VA is supposed to have an LGBT veteran care coordinator. Um, unfortunately, it's not like a paid position. It's, it's part of uh, the role for whoever serves as the Equal Employment Opportunity Officer. So some VAs see a lesser need to afford the time to do the LGBT veteran care coordinator work. Um, and some VAs are really excellent. Um, this one right here, have it on their brochure, the VA has a zero tolerance for discriminatory behavior by veteran patients, visitors, or staff. And you would never guess where this is. St. Louis, Missouri. Um, that shocked me, um, <laughs> but they, they also, they, are, um, they were recognized on the Healthcare Equality Index as an LGBTQ healthcare equality leader, um, and that just came through in a VA email. Um, they have an LGBT History Month that they observe every March. They also have an LGBT History Month in October, and of course they celebrate Pride in June. Um, and some VAs have a really phenomenal LGBT program. Uh, the one in Syracuse is really amazing. Um, Manhattan VA is really good. Um, so they're really trying. And um, that's one of the things that Z SAGE does as well as we work with the VA. We try to uh, work with the veterans to make sure they are getting enrolled if they need that extra health care. Um, I'm putting uh, home-based primary care together for a veteran who's really struggling to 
get to the VA. Um, and so that's sort of what this program is about. Um, but again, I just want to thank Wendy McClinton and Ty Martin and Herbert Sweat Jr. for being here today and certainly for all of you for taking the time out of your day to be with us tonight. This has been a very heavy and a very meaningful program um, for me and I'm, I'm really grateful for you all being here. And Ty, you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, please. If I could just say something else. Um, when I was 17, I went into the Navy, and I'm, I'm 72 now. Yeah, yeah, I'm se I said it. I'm 72 years old. Wow. And still alive. But um, there was another gentleman in here, and he's going to he's gonna hate me when I, I do this. Well, I was 17, and he was 21, and that was in 65. And James Sullivan, can you stand up? <laughs> so I've known this sailor, that sailor, for the last, if you do the math, 17 minus, what, about 45 years? Wow. And we were both in denial, and we were uh, <laughs> both afraid to even think about coming out of the closet. And, and look at him now, he's married, he has a husband, and he lives in New York, and it's a beautiful life. And none of this would have been possible if the United States Navy had not allowed me to come in. So whenever we think there's no hope, you never know. Once again, as a veteran today, yes, if I have to use to be a hospital, if I must use their services, I'm more open to it now. Because in my mind, I'm hoping that it's not what I thought it was 40, 50 years ago. Thank you, Ty. Um, so in closing this, when we experience or witness discrimination in any form, it is up to us to speak out. Silence is not an option here. Um, so take that away with you tonight. Um, and we're going to continue this program next month. Sage Vets is working, uh, are partnering up with the National Association of Black Military Women. Um, we're going to be hearing voices from women veterans. And I really hope you'll join us at the Sage Center in say, uh, uh, Chelsea. We have a question. Okay. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you again, everybody.